This is the new 2023 Fisker Ocean, and it's the latest new electric SUV on the market. In fact, it's the latest new brand on the market, intending to rival Tesla and anyone else who's stepping up to the electric SUV plate. This is a very weird and quirky vehicle in a good way, and today I'm going to review the new Fisker Ocean and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this Fisker Ocean is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids. The Fisker Ocean has just come out. The very first units have just started being delivered and this one could be yours on cars and bids. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to visit the live auction for this new Fisker Ocean, one of the very first first, and you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the Fisker Ocean. Starting with, you open up the door and the word power is stamped into the side of the car. Not just printed on some little panel like your car where it says Honda or BMW or Mercedes. I mean power is stamped into the sheet metal when they're building this car car power and that's just the beginning of the weird stuff about the Fisker Ocean strap in because this video is gonna be quirky and featuring but let me start with a little overview size this is 188 inches long the model Y is 187 the Mach E is 186 so that's the size class we're in as for pricing the base model Fisker Ocean starts just under forty thousand dollars and the top of the line is around seventy thousand dollars so that's your price and sizing this Fisker Ocean is a limited edition first production model called the Ocean One that's at the the very top of the range, right around that $70,000 price point. As for performance, the base model has a single motor with 275 horsepower, but this one has dual motors and 565 horsepower. Zero to 60 is in 3.7 seconds, and it has an EPA rated range of around 360 miles. But let's move on to the quirks. There are oh so many. And so we must first start with getting in and the key. Now on one side you have the Fisker logo. We'll get back to Fisker and exactly what this brand is in a few minutes. But flip over the key and on the other side you have five buttons and they all do interesting things. So the tailgate button's pretty obvious. You press that, the tailgate goes up. No big deal. There's a lock button and there's also an unlock button. Now when you press unlock some unusual things happen. Specifically, the rear lights do a dance and the rear badge lights up to welcome you to your car. And the two little lines from the Fisker logo project onto the pavement and they pulsate. They don't just show a static graphic like every other car. They kind of turn on and off while you walk up to the car after pressing the unlock button. But that's not the coolest thing you can do with the key. Next, we have this button, which has like the rear of the car partially missing. That's because it opens the rear glass, which rolls rolls down automatically. You press that button, the rear glass rolls down, and then you can stick stuff in the cargo area without having to open up the tailgate. Just like an old school Jeep Wagoneer or a Toyota 4Runner, the Ocean has that too. But that's still not the coolest thing you can do with the key fob. That honor goes to the button at the top. It's an image of the sun. And actually it's called California mode. You press that and everything opens. And I I mean all of the windows, the sunroof, the rear window and the cargo area, the tailgate, and even these rear side windows on the cargo area, which don't open up in any other car. Well, they open up in the Fisker Ocean. And when you press that sun button, as you saw, everything opens up at once. So when you climb into the car, you don't get into some hot, stuffy, closed up environment. Everything is open. It feels sunny and breezy and 
California-like. And when you want to close it all up, just press that button again, and everything automatically closes again all at once. All the windows, the sunroof, the side windows, the rear, it all closes up with the push of one button on the key fob. Very interesting quirk. And next up, we move back here for some more interesting quirks, although I do want to hit again, this rear window opens. <laughs> it's worth mentioning a second time because it's just so unusual. There's no third row seat back here to take advantage of this. It just opens up to maximize the airflow in the car. I've never seen this before in any other vehicle, but the Fisker Ocean has it, and I wanted to really underscore it. And it's also worth pointing out, it's not the only weird thing in this vicinity. Vicinity. That's because there's a turn signal here. This vertical light bar is a turn signal that lights up when you put on the turn signals over on the side of the car. And it's not there for regulation because they had to. There is a European regulation that says that cars have to have turn signals on the side, not just the front and back. But most automakers take care of that with the mirrors, which the Fisker Ocean has a turn signal mounted on the mirrors. This one is just here separately an extra turn signal to make sure everyone knows when you're driving a Fisker Ocean exactly where you're turning. An interesting little rear pillar turn signal quirk. And next up, still more lighting related quirks with the Fisker Ocean. You have this thin tail light strip. The brake lights are here on the side of the car. And that meant the turn signals had to be somewhere else because the signals can't be on this panel. It's mounted on the tailgate, which opens up. And government regulations say that brake lights and turn signals can't be on a piece of bodywork that moves because it could be dangerous. So the turn signals are down here, integrated into the bumper, kind of an unorthodox position. Other interesting items around back. Well, the Fisker logo in the center. I like how it's kind of floating on the tailgate. It gives this cool sort of suspended impression. You also have Ocean printed under that, which is of course the model name, the Fisker Ocean, and then One, which is the trim level for this one. It's a limited first edition model, the Ocean One. But let's talk about Fisker for just a second. What exactly is Fisker? Well, you may remember Fisker from the Karma, which was a weird looking sedan they made a little over 10 years ago as a plug-in hybrid. The Fisker that makes the Ocean is not the same company as the Fisker that made the Karma. It's the same guy who runs it. His name is Henrik Fisker, and he was a car designer. He designed the BMW Z8, in fact, but he really wanted to run his own car company. So he created Fisker, they made the Karma, they failed, and now there's a new Fisker, completely separate from the old one, that makes the Ocean. New Fisker is headquartered here in Southern California. The Ocean is their very first car, although more have been announced, and more are certainly coming. And next up, let's move on to the rest of the exterior of this car, starting with the top, where there are more interesting quirks. One is the rear roof spoiler. It has the word Fisker in giant print pointing upwards. People in airplanes and helicopters can see. You remember power was printed on the stamping on the door sill? Well, here's Fisker. Now, the other interesting thing on the roof is a solar panel. You can see a rather large one stretching the entire length of the roof, and it's functional, and it helps to charge the car. In fact, Fisker claims that this solar panel will give you about 1,500 miles of range every year in normal driving just from charging the sun. There's like an inverter that converts the solar energy to battery power. I don't know how it all works, but a solar panel that gives driving range is a pretty cool feature for a save the planet electric vehicle. And next up we move around up front where it's actually not all that interesting or unusual, but there still are a few items worth noting. One is, once again, the Fisker badge looks like it's floating or suspended over the hood, which is, again, a pretty cool look and certainly distinctive to this car. Now, it's worth pointing out, even though it's mounted on the hood, this isn't actually a hood. The Fisker Ocean doesn't have a front trunk. Some EVs do, some EVs don't. This one doesn't. No storage up here. So you may be wondering, how do you put windshield washer fluid in this car? <laughs> Maybe you're not wondering that, but if you are, there's this little panel at the base of the windshield where you can add it. It has this cool little graphic showing a 
Fisker Ocean with windshield washer spray <laughs> spraying on it. It's kind of cool. Also worth pointing out up here, you have the charger for this car. It's mounted on the front driver's side fender. You just tap it and it swings open, as you can see. As for charging speed, the Fisker Ocean can fast charge from 10 to 80% in around 35 minutes. That's pretty common in electric vehicles today, and the Ocean matches what a lot of its rivals can do. But anyway, next we climb inside the Fisker Ocean, and based on how weird this thing is outside, you're expecting a lot of weird inside, and you're gonna get it. So, to get inside, you push the unlock button on the key fob, the door handles pop out automatically. Until then, they're flush with the body, but they pop out when it's unlocked. You can pull on the door handle and, of course, open up the door, and then you are greeted with power. <laughs> printed on the side. Now, there is also a little label that says ocean on the door sill, but it is very, very subtle. They really want you to take notice of power. <laughs> so, you climb inside, you sit down in the driver's seat, and there is no start-stop button. To start this car, you put your foot on the brake pedal, and with the key in your pocket, it knows you're in there, it knows you're sitting down, and then it gets going. Now, you have to put your foot on the brake pedal twice. The first tap is like accessories mode in a car with a key. The second tap actually turns it on and lets you shift it into gear and drive away. And as for that shifting, is done with a column shifter coming off the steering column. Column. You push it down for drive, up for reverse, and park is a little button at the end. And this car is odd, and so when you go into forward and reverse, well, it makes some odd noises. Take a listen to drive. And then take a listen to reverse. <laughs> Now, beyond the sounds it makes, this car also, as you might expect, has drive modes. There are three of them controlled with this button on the steering wheel. You push that and you can switch between Earth, Fun, and Hyper. And the drive mode that you're in is displayed on this little screen directly above the steering wheel. This screen is not big, it's not much, but it gives you the basics. The time, the date, the drive mode, your range, all the basic stuff you need while you're driving. And this gives you a bit of an advantage over Tesla, where everything is in the center screen and you don't have anything right in your field of vision on the Model Y and the 3. That's a big complaint of a lot of people driving Teslas. This car solves it. And speaking of screens, you've probably already noticed the main screen in the middle of the interior, which is gigantic and vertical, just like a cell phone holding it up in your hand, but it doesn't have to be vertical. You see this button in the center on the bottom of the screen with the Fisker logo? If you press that and hold it down, down, well, the screen switches, and now it's horizontal, as you can see. So, you can decide whether you want the screen vertically oriented or horizontally oriented. The information is the same, but obviously displayed differently, and you can choose based on your own preference. Of course, you want to switch back, just press and hold that button again. The screen switches right back to vertical, and you can do that as many times as you want, depending on what you like best. Now, as for using the screen, I'll get into some of its quirks in a second, but the operation itself is generally pretty good. Pretty quick to respond, very intuitive. Some screens are a little bit laggy, laggier than you might see on other automakers' infotainment, but it's pretty good for a first effort from this brand, and just in general. I think most people will find it's usable, easy, as you can see, fairly simple and responsive and nice to figure out. Now, one big win for this infotainment screen control center is that the climate controls are not integrated into this center screen. Instead, they have dedicated physical buttons below the screen and a readout separate just for climate control. So you can change the basic stuff, your air temperature, your fan speed, turn on your defroster, defogger, all down here on this little climate screen, which means you don't have to go into any menus to do climate stuff, which is a big win for this car. And another advantage, at least in most people's eyes, over Tesla. Now, as you can imagine, there are some interesting things integrated into this screen, and I don't want to dive too deep into the tech in this car, but I'm going to show you the weird ones. For example, this car has a boost mode where you can do like a launch control start and accelerate fast, but you can see here it shows how many boosts you have left. Apparently they limit each car to only 500 uses of boost mode in order to preserve the driveline components, and so it actually shows how many you have and how many you've used, which I think is going to become almost like my 
mileage. When you're selling a Fisker, people are going to ask, how many boosts do you have left? If you're down into the 200s or the 100s, they might think you've abused this car a little bit, and it's interesting to see that right there. Now, another interesting screen function is the screen directs the position of the climate vents. You go into the climate menu with more detailed climate controls, and this is where you move around the climate vents. So you do have your basic climate controls down below, but if you want to move the vents themselves, you got to go into the screen. Not everybody is going to love that. Also, you use the screen to adjust the steering wheel. Well, mostly anyway, you go into the steering wheel adjustment menu, and then from there, it enables this little wheel on the side of the steering wheel to adjust the steering wheel up, down, back, forward. That is a pretty cool touch. Tesla does it too, but well, it's a neat thing to see anywhere. Now, one other interesting screen feature, if you go into the vehicle tab in here, you have a welcome message from Henrik Fisker. Again, he was a designer. He started the original Fisker company. Now this one also, and he's in here giving you a message, I guess, thanking you for buying his car. There he is on your screen. <laughs> Well, kind of unusual. But anyway, like I said, don't want to get into too much screen and tech stuff because there are a lot more quirks to cover in this car. So below the screen, you have two separate wireless charging pads, which is pretty cool. Driver and passenger each have their own. And moving down from there, you open up the center console and you can see there's a tray. It folds out and over the driver's lap and you can sit in this car and use a laptop or eat a sandwich, ideally while you're charging. If you're sitting somewhere charging up and you don't really have anything to do, here's a little tray where you can do something. Frankly, I think that's a pretty cool idea. Also worth pointing out, it looks like the passenger has the ability to have that tray also. You can see in front of the center console, there's nothing in this slot, but that's where it would go. So maybe you can buy an accessory tray for the passenger as well. Now, speaking of the passenger area, this car does not have a glove box, which is certainly an unusual decision, but it does have some other clever storage areas, particularly particularly little storage compartments below the seats. The driver's seat, you open up this little panel and then there's storage under there. Same deal over on the passenger side. Open up this panel and you have a storage compartment under the seats. Kind of extra hidden compartments compared to a glove box. You also have extra storage behind the center screen. There's a, a compartment back here where you can put stuff. It's open, but it does have a place for things. And below the center console, there's yet another storage compartment where you can put even more stuff. And of course, you can also stick more stuff in the center console storage area itself, although a lot of it is taken up by that driver tray. And frankly, that's a decent trade-off that I would make. I like that tray. But anyway, next, moving up to the ceiling in the center, you once again have this sun button to go into California mode. And once again, if you push that, everything goes down and opens up at once. The rear window, the side windows, even the cargo area one, the sunroof, it all opens up on a sunny day and you're in California mode in this car. Now, it is worth pointing out, you don't have to press that button to open up all this stuff. You can, of course, do it one by one. You have your regular window controls on the door panel where you can roll down all the windows. You also have your sunroof control right here. You push that and the sunroof opens up. And you have the rear window control also right here in the overhead center console. You push that and the rear cargo area window goes down, like on a Toyota 4Runner, Sequoia, Tundra, you have that rear window. So California mode opens all the stuff at once, but you can also open it one by one if you choose, except for those side cargo area windows. I haven't found any button that opens those, and it looks like you can't do that unless you're in California mode, which really opens up the car entirely. And there's still more. On the A pillar on the driver's side, you have this. You might be wondering exactly what it is. Well, it's a camera that's monitoring the driver. A lot of these driver assist systems use a camera to make sure the driver's eyes are facing forward. So when the system is driving the car, they know the driver is still paying attention. Exactly how does the driver assist work in the ocean? We'll find out. I haven't used it yet, but I'm excited to check it out when I drive this car a little bit later. Other interesting items, the sun visors are cool. They're split in half, which allows you much more control over exactly how much sun Sun you want to block out. You can do partial sum. They're very like movable and placeable, so you can perfectly block 
block out what you want. Same deal on the passenger side. The only drawback is it makes the visor mirror a lot smaller because it has to fit into one of the two halves. And indeed it does, but that means you can't really see much of yourself in the visor mirror. But that's another trade-off I'm happy to make for this kind of trick half seas sun visor. Also worth pointing out in this vicinity, the rear view mirror, which right now, as you can see, is a rear view mirror. But if you flip this switch below the mirror, it turns into a camera, which I vastly prefer. If you have your car full of stuff, you can't use the mirror to see through it. So having a camera there lets you see behind you, even if your car is filled or dirty in the back. Pretty cool. And next up, we move on to the back seat in the Fisker Ocean, which is shockingly large. I sit back here and I've got a ton of room, leg room, knee room, head room, and I'm pretty tall, six foot four adult sitting in the back of what's ultimately like a compact to mid-size crossover, and it is pretty decent size back here. I'm actually shocked by just how much room there is. And there's even extra room for the middle passenger. Usually that's considered like the worst seat. Well, here they've curved in the back of the front center console, so even that passenger has extra leg room, which you just don't see in that many vehicles. You also don't have to contend with a hump in the rear floor like so many cars because you got a motor up front, a motor in back, they're not linked. And so there's nothing stealing middle legroom back here. It's quite an impressive rear seat room situation. And there are a few interesting quirks back here. For one, on the back of that front center console, there's a little panel in the legroom area. You push that and it drops down two USB-C chargers for devices back here, which is obviously nice to have. You also have a rear center armrest. You can fold that that down and it reveals a screen which you can use to turn on your heated rear seats and to adjust your rear seat climate control. So you do have a little controls back here for that stuff. Presuming that nobody's sitting in the middle seat, then you can't use it. Also in that rear center armrest, you have cup holders. You fold this out and here they are. They're not very big. They're actually unusually small and they're the only cup holders in the rear seat, which is a bit of a drawback for parents who have kids with a lot of water bottles bottles or sports drinks or whatever. You don't really have a lot of space back here for that stuff, whereas some cars really go all out and give you a lot of rear cup holders, not here. Also a little annoying, speaking of storage, you don't have storage pockets on the backs of the front seats. So many other cars have that, but unfortunately not here. A little annoyance, but an annoyance nonetheless. As for folding down the rear seats, frankly pretty easy. Just like in every other car, there's a little latch at the top of the backrest. You push it and then the seat folds down and gives you extra cargo space if you need. Nothing unusual or quirky there. And next up we move on to the cargo area, which is shockingly uninteresting given the weirdness of this car. Not that it's easy to make a cargo area interesting, but well, it isn't. Anyway, to get to the cargo area, there's a little button under here. You push and then the tailgate pops open automatically. Of course, you can also just press the tailgate button on the key fob, but tailgate opens and you can see the cargo area. Again, not that interesting and actually not all that big. It feels a little small, even compared to rivals like Model Y and Mach-E. And I wonder if some of that great rear seat space has taken up some of the cargo area space, which is a trade-off I would probably make, especially if I frequently carried rear passengers. Now, there is a little extra cargo area storage under the floor, like in a lot of cars, but not a huge amount. You don't have a massive cargo area back here. Now, again, it's worth pointing out, I do like the fact that you don't have to open the tailgate to put stuff back. You can just drop the rear window with that button on the key fob and stick stuff in the cargo area, which is a nice touch. I also like that on the inside of the tailgate, the light that shows you what you're doing in the cargo area is these two lines from the Fisker logo. It's a subtle little nod to what this car is, but it does add a little bit of quirkiness to the tailgate. And then of course, Fisker is hoping that little logo and some brand loyalty catch on. One of the interesting things about this car is Fisker doesn't have dealerships like Tesla. They're doing a direct to consumer sales model and they don't have a factory. This car is built by Magna Steer in Austria, which also makes the Mercedes-Benz G-Class, the Jaguar I-Pace and others. But Fisker figured by not having to deal with the cost of building a factory and establishing dealerships, they could kind of keep the price down a little bit. And frankly, at least on paper, it does seem tremendously compelling for the price point. But the question is, how does it drive? So let's take the Fisker Ocean out on the road and find out. All right, driving the Fisker Ocean. <laughs> uh, I have to admit, I, I hadn't paid a lot of attention to this car. 
I'd heard about it, that it was coming out, but I was just thinking, oh, another startup, oh, Fisker tried once and failed, you know, the previous Fisker company, and oh, another EV. I, I it just didn't, I didn't put a lot of thought into this car. Um, but now that I started to poke around it and learn about it, I'm kind of into it. For one thing, it's an attractive car. And Henrik Fisker is a good designer. I mean, he designed the Z8, which is one of the most beautiful cars, the Aston Martin Vantage, which is one of the most beautiful cars. All this stuff's been pretty good. The Fisker Karma, in my opinion, is an exception. But this is a nice looking car. On the outside, it looks good. It's eye catching while not being like ugly, which is a hard thing to pull off, by the way. Um, it's a nice looking car. And so there's that. The interior is also nice. It's a lot nicer than Tesla although that's not a very high bar, but it is nice inside this car. And of course the tech is pretty good. The system is definitely more laggy than, you know, some rivals, most rivals I would say actually, but it's, it's good, it's good enough and it's usable and it's fine um, and it's intuitive and all that. And it's a big screen, which is what everybody's after these days. But of course the big question is, how does it drive? So let's find out. Okay, so I'm in heavy traffic here, so I'm gonna start by using the driver assist, and I have it set. Oh boy. <laughs> I need to figure this system out because I just had it set to 30 and it was gonna hit the car in front of me. Truthfully, I think in an effort to go minimalist, they've made the directions a little bit too difficult to figure out here. And so I'm not exactly sure if it's, if it's, adaptive cruise controlling or not. I did get it to adaptive cruise control before and it seemed like it was doing fine, but I'm not sure if that system is on or not. I'm pressing the steering wheel buttons and I'm not so sure if it's working. Okay, the car in front of me is slowing down and no, we are not slowing down. There's a way to do it because it just did it. I just, I'm, I'm, it's maybe not as intuitive as it ought to be. There, it should be a simple button push on the steering wheel and that's not working. So let's talk about the rest of the driving experience. Oh, floored it really goes. <laughs> But that's true of all EVs now. That no longer gives you like street cred as an EV that you accelerate fast. That was just in earth mode, by the way. Just moved it into fun mode and it feels even faster. This is a quick vehicle. It's not Tesla Plaid quick, but it is like really serious fast, especially for 70 grand. Zero to 60 and 3.7, that's like career GT levels. Oh, now I'm in hyper and wow. <laughs> this is really quick. This is really, really, really quick. But again, that's common now in a lot of electric vehicles, the, uh, the high performance. We're not gonna give that a huge benefit to this car because so many, you know, the Kia EV6 GT, the Model Y Performance, the Mach-E GT, they all have it. You can do fast acceleration a lot easier in an electric car than you can in a gas one. So the driving experience itself, the ride quality seems to be uh, pretty good. About what I'd expect at this price point. It certainly is not Mercedes-Benz S-Class levels of luxury and quality in terms of, you know, like a luxury car, but it's like a decent, you know, mid-size compact crossover. Feels a lot like Model Y. And the same goes for the sounds are you hearing. There's more road noise, there's more tire noise, there's more wind noise than you'd get in like a true high-end luxury car, but it's totally fine at this price point. It's kind of exactly what you'd expect actually. Now, one thing I do wanna say, I've read some reviews of this car where people talk about glitches and problems they've experienced. I can't say that I've had that. There is been one drawback, which is when I press the button to open up the rear window for the tailgate, it has only worked some of the time. And by the way, when you're getting one of these brand new first off the line cars, things like that often happen. Other than that, it hasn't really been that big of a problem. It's driving exactly as I'd expect. I'm not really seeing any issues, um, which isn't what I'd expect, honestly, especially from what I've heard. These oceans I've heard have been a little temperamental, the early ones, but this one seems like it's doing exactly what you'd expect. From a steering and handling perspective, it drives uh, like a crossover, which is to say, it's not that, the steering is pretty quick, but it doesn't handle all that well. There's clearly some weight. You're kind of pushing around corners. It's not as stable as a sports car or even a high performance SUV like a BMW X3M. It's not on that level. The performance of this vehicle is really done with the acceleration and relatively quick steering, although that's not really a substitute for great handling, like the feel of the weight of the car as you're going around a corner. I wish I could try out California mode, but unfortunately it happens to be raining today in California. Uh, but there's a lot to like here. And I think the big question on everybody's mind is, is this company solvent? Are they gonna stay around for a long time? And is this vehicle gonna be reliable? If the answer is yes to all those, I think you have a pretty big hit on your hands, or at least a car that could be a big hit if people adopt it. Um, there will always be a lot of people who would prefer a traditional manufacturer's car, a Hyundai Ioniq 5, a Kia EV6, a Mach-E. But if you're willing to kind of try something new, even something newer than Tesla, uh, this is a pretty neat car 
if it remains reliable, user-friendly, you know, not difficult to service, all that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot to like here and it definitely checks a different box than, than Tesla in kind of a fun and cool and quirky way with some very neat, you could call them gimmicks, but I think nice features that, that attract a lot of attention and will surely attract a lot of interest. And so that's the new 2023 Fisker Ocean, the latest new electric SUV on the market and certainly an interesting and quirky one. <laughs> Rivian, Tesla, Fisker, the new brands are all coming with new electric vehicles and the old brands have them too. And this is certainly an interesting rival for for all of them. And now it's time to give the new Fisker Ocean a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 68 out of 100, which places the Fisker Ocean 1 here against rivals. Tied for the very top with the Kia EV6 GT, the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT, and the Tesla Model Y Performance, all of which are fantastic. So is the Fisker Ocean. It looks good, it performs well, it's priced reasonably, it has some cool features, but this score is based on it staying reliable and easy to own. The car I drove had some glitches, but it's a very early model and they were minor, but Fisker had better tighten things up fast because this is a competitive segment and people will bail on the ocean and go with more established competition unless they can prove this car is going to be painless to own.